The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, good afternoon everybody. This is uh, Krishna Vadula here and um, uh, we have with us Dr. Lisa Benson. In just about a minute or two, we will get the um, uh, webinar started. We just wanted to say hello. Hello. Uh, yeah, we'll get started in just about a minute or two. Yeah. Okay. So just, um, I think they, they are, people are wandering in still, so I don't want to, yeah. so this is the last minute and people rushing into the room kind of. <laughs> yeah, they're coming in. Good 
have asked a question uh, whether some of them will be in groups. You know, I, I'm pretty sure some of them will be sitting in a room where mm -hmm. this, this is a broadcast on a screen and uh, maybe 30 or 40 faculty might be sitting. Uh, we could ask that question, you know, I could ask that question right away you know, as to who is doing that, just, just to get a sense of uh, what's going on. Okay, so uh, this is 6 o'clock in the morning for me and for Lisa, uh, who are in the United States, and um, 4.30 for all of you um, after a long working day, I guess. You may be a little <laughs> tired, but uh, right, I'm sure we'll wake you up, stimulate you with the exciting webinar that we're going to have with Dr. Lisa Benson, who is a professor at uh, Clemson University. As many of you might have heard of Clemson University. Uh, I will ask her to introduce herself in just a minute. And the topic is Introduction to STEM Education Research Methods. Uh, as many of you already probably know, STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. So some of the research methods are fairly common to all these uh, four uh, areas. And uh, and as you all know, we are, you know, Indo-Universal Indo Collaboration in Engineering Education has been trying to promote uh, engineering education research among a large number of colleges throughout, throughout India in the last several years. Uh, we've had these conferences on transformations in engineering education where many of you have published and uh, uh, your uh, research in engineering education. So, and, 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 and for the most part, though, many faculty in Indian engineering colleges, this is a new new concept. And so here's a, an introduction from one of the experts in the world, uh, Dr. Lisa Benson. And over to you, uh, Lisa, it's yours. Okay, thank you very much, and I'm so glad to have everyone attending today. This is really exciting for me to be able to talk to so many people on the other side of the world. Uh, so this is, as uh, Krishna said, an introduction to engineering education research methods, and, and I broadly described it as STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, because really the methods that we're using cross over uh, between engineering and other STEM disciplines like chemistry, physics, mathematics, computer science. Um, really engineering never operates in isolation so um, I broadly describe it as STEM education research methods and again I thank you very much for the invitation to do this this webinar. I do want to give an acknowledgement that uh, much of the material that I'll be presenting was actually presented to me in a workshop that I attended about 10 years ago called Rigorous Research in Engineering Education. Uh, it was a, an NSF funded project uh, with collaborators from University of Minnesota and Colorado School of Mines. Carl Smith and Ruth Strebler were the uh, PIs or pr principal investigators on that project. Um, and this is really where I got my start doing engineering education research. Um, and so along that line, a little bit about me. Um, my background is actually in bioengineering. Um, I have all three degrees in bioengineering from different universities here in the US. Um, but I received training in education research um, starting with that workshop on rigorous research in engineering education. Um, I, I took and audited several courses in education learning theories on um, research methods. And also I have selected and sought out collaborators who have expertise in areas that I was interested in. Uh, for example, education psychology and quantitative methods and qualitative methods. So some of my collaborators are in the School of Education at my own institution, um, at other institutions, um, and uh, in psychology departments and experimental statistics departments, things like that. Um, I've also um, learned sort of on the job, really, um, through doing things like participating in panels and in um, reviewing um, articles for uh, conferences, things like that. There's it's sort of a, 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 an array of different activities that you can participate in to build expertise in education research, which I've done over the past 10 years. I was fortunate to be able to join a department at Clemson University that was focused on this discipline-based education research, also called DEBER. Um, and that's basically education research that grows out of expertise in a specific discipline, such as engineering, chemistry, physics, for example. Um, over the past 10 years, I've been principal investigator on several grants amounting to over a million dollars and co-PI on grants with my collaborators over half a million dollars. So I've 
I've achieved success uh, through building my expertise and by collaborating with others uh, to, to conduct education research. Uh, my research focuses mainly on student motivation and learning in engineering and, and the intersection of those two things. Um, I've written journal papers and peer-reviewed conference papers, and most recently I've become deputy editor for the Journal of Engineering Education. So that's, that's my expertise. I would like to know a little bit about you, about who I'm speaking to. Um, you know, it's always a good idea to know your audience. Um, so I'd like to ask you a couple of questions um, that you can answer through a poll that I believe is being created. Um, first, I would like to know how much experience you have conducting education research. Um, if this is your first experience, um, if you have some training, but maybe you haven't conducted education research yourself, but you're, you know, you're aware of it, or if you've collaborated on some projects, or if you are actually lead investigator on one or more projects. So I'd, I'd just like to get a sense of where you are with your, um, with your expertise. And then the second question. Oh, wait. Let, let, let's wait on the okay. second one. I think okay, they're, I'll they're wait. working on the first one. Yeah, the first okay. one has been launched. The first one has been launched and we're getting okay, some results. We already, okay. we already have about 40% voted. Uh, we have a total of 68 at uh, 65 attendees so far. At least one of them has said there are 50 people in one room, <clears throat> and uh, and so the results are coming in. Keep coming in. I mean, I encourage you all to vote because we need to get a sense, sense of uh, what is the audience. And and I think what I'm seeing is kind of typical of what I've seen the last few years in you know, in, in India. Is uh, I'll let you know what the results are in just another okay, that would be good. 30 seconds or so. So uh, they're coming in. You know, I think uh, yeah, so still. Uh, I'm looking for a few more. I've got 60% of you voted, guys. I need many more. Come on, make up. <laughs> Press that button. Uh, write it down. You click. All you do is click, 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 click one of the options. Go ahead. Keep coming. Keep coming. Yeah, just... uh, yeah we've got about two-thirds of the men. Um, uh, usually, we get much better response, but I guess maybe they are... Some of them are uh, in, in uh, are doing these on uh, mobiles, on test cell phones, and so may or may not have the ability to to come in, but uh, let's see. Uh, okay, so uh, so I'm I'm going I'm going to stop the poll, and here you know I think I think you have enough information. You can, you can close the poll and show the results, uh, Sridhar. Uh, okay, uh, that you see. Uh, okay, maybe I don't know if you see it on the screen, uh, Lisa, but uh, I'll read out read it out to you. May as a, as a, as a presenter, you may or may not be seeing it. Uh, this is my first experience exploring in digital. Ah. 40, 43 percent. The first one is 43 mm -hmm. percent. Okay. Second one have some training but not conducted educational research. Another 40 percent. So they are, and so uh, and 15 percent said they've collaborated on some education research projects. Only three percent have said they have taken the lead on some engineering education research projects. Okay. okay. So they get the profile. The first two are the majority. Okay. Okay. So that that's very helpful. So this introduction will. Um, will really, it's meant to give you um, an overview of some of the terminology, some of the ways that we describe education research, and some of the um, resources that you can seek out um, to, to get more training. So uh, my second poll question is just uh, really uh, figuring out where you are in your, your primary area of study. Um, are you in an engineering discipline, a STEM discipline other than engineering, such as computer science, um, an education discipline, I don't know if we have education um, specialists out there, or um, STEM education in, in particular. So if you could answer that. Yep, that works like right. Yeah, most of our audience is in engineering or STEM, engineering. okay. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. correct. Oh, you can see the results, okay, that's great. Okay, I, yeah. I figured that one out, yes, how to show ah, okay. <laughs> I am <more>. trainable. <laughs> A few seconds, yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. So that's good to know. So we're all in in STEM disciplines, but it's also good to know that we're not all engineers here. Um, and again, that's very typical. I I really enjoy um, the department that I'm in because mm -hmm. it is not strictly engineering education research. It is we are engineering and science education. So I work with math education specialists, um, researchers in chemistry education. Um, I work with computer science quite a bit, looking at different um, efforts and, you know, uh, new new ways of presenting, you know, to educate our computer science students, things like that. So it's it's a very exciting place to be. So can you that's share, good to know. Can you share that for a few seconds? Yeah. 
to share the results with everybody. Okay, so okay. Uh, everybody can see on the screen, 59% uh, you know, engineering, uh, so 36%, you know, including computer science, physics, IT, etc. And then we, uh, zero in education, and, and that's that, that's a that's an inherent weakness in the Indian system. They don't have uh, uh, too many uh, strong uh, colleges of engineering education doing research in engineering education uh, in, in education rather. Uh, they do have some departments of education, but I think mostly they're in the, more in the traditional you know uh, departments of education. So that would be a, a significant uh, issue as uh, the community in India starts moving forward. Mm -hmm. uh, in, of engineering education research, because you, as, as, as you, as you, I'm sure, will emphasize, you know, it's important to have people who understand the learning discipline, uh, you know, very thoroughly, very well. You know. So, but anyway, go ahead. It's, uh, exactly. All back to you. Exactly. Yeah. And and it's very similar across the, the globe, really. Um, it because STEM education. Uh, or discipline-based education research is it's difficult to establish because we do have traditional schools of education um, at all of our you know many universities and um, people often wonder what so why do we need STEM education why do we need discipline-based education research and I yeah. think you'll see uh, through the presentation that it's it is important to really understand your your students difficulties the challenges that they face in their STEM discipline courses. You know, it's really hard to design some type of intervention or some type of course that will help students learn thermodynamics, for example, unless you really understand what it is about thermodynamics that they find difficult um, or what it is about um, a, an engineering program that might tend to keep some students out um, and others, you know, that wouldn't even consider coming into engineering unless you really understand the nature of what it is that, that you're asking them to do in that program. So um, this is great. This is, um, great. this is, we're at the beginning. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. So let's get going then. Um, and I think I need to maybe close that. Uh, I think um, you're okay. Uh, we are seeing your screen. Just move, move the okay. next slide. Move to the next and slide. I, I don't know why my slides are not advancing. Uh, there go. Oh, there we go. There go. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so what does conducting research involve? And I want you to think about this just from the perspective of your own research experience. Um, oops. Sorry. Okay. From from your own research experience, you can you can imagine think think right now in your head about your experience doing research. Where do you start? First, you would you would form a research question. You'd establish a hypothesis around that question. You would collect some data. You'd analyze the results and draw conclusions and determine if your hypothesis is supported or not. Then you would report the results, maybe you would publish it, um, and you'd, you'd talk about the implications of the results. What do they mean? Well, from your own experience conducting research, that you know that that first step is a good research question. So I'd like you to, share, to think and reflect right now, what are the attributes of a good research question? And again, this is just from your own experience. Don't, you're not thinking specifically about education research, but just it, research in general. What are the attributes of a good research question? You could take about a half a minute to reflect on what those key attributes are and, and write maybe on a piece of paper or even if you're, if you're working on a device, um, type it out on your device or whatever, but just jot down whatever comes to mind. Great, good, good question. Uh, so I urge all the participants, I've got about 72 of you here. Uh, so uh, you know, hopefully some of you will um, make the effort to start type in uh, some of these uh, uh, three key attributes. If not three, at least one, each, each of you. I just put one in there to start with in the mm -hmm. chat box. Uh, to start with, at least put one in the chat box. Don't wait for all three. Uh, just put one and we'll wait for a minute or two to see if, uh, if uh, you know, we get some, uh, get some reaction from the audience. Uh, they're still thinking, the, the first half minute. So keep at it, folks. Yeah, I know so that, many that of is you are. the... Uh... Yeah, the key is to just sit and sort of brainstorm. Yeah, just to think, and then and then share um, maybe yeah. some one or two or three key attributes. Yeah, it's not it's not something that jumps out in your mind right away. I think you have to sit back a little bit and say, what is it, it that I'm thinking about? <laughs> definitely, definitely. We tend to just jump right into our research and not sit back and sort of think yeah, in a meta, meta kind of way. Reflection. What is reflection. it that makes a good question? All about reflection. Yeah. 
Okay, let's see. I think they're still reflecting. I think I think we hit them you know, <laughs> right out of the blue here. At, okay, we got, we got something day, coming in. At the end of a long work day, that's right. Yeah, uh, we have a few that uh, just introduced themselves. Let's see. Uh, okay, one of them says uh, uh, original concept. Mm -hmm. Another says uh, ob objectives, outcomes, and methodology. Uh, another one says the innovation to the point to the question. Uh, should the question be you know, should it be practice or theory? Uh, will this be useful to society? Uh, then another one again says society technical, economic related. Uh, intent of research uh, rounded, a well rounded intent of research outcome. What problem will it address? High level of research approach. What are the dependencies and assumptions in the research? Uh, another one says problem analysis, knowing the causes and giving solutions. Another one says sustainability, innovation, uh, and green. Another one says continuous exercise and thinking. So yeah, they're, they're all over the place, but maybe you get some idea what you know what they're, what's going on in their minds at this point. Uh, another one says practical application. Another one says something that helps humanity and which is practical as well. Uh, okay, so uh, okay. Okay, what, so you've what, got a great, what a great audience this is. <laughs> you just set this up beautifully. Yeah, doable <laughs> this with, is great. They're doable within all the constraints, benefits to humanity. That keeps coming up a lot, real world yes. and humanity. From my view, I see that some uh, that same course outcome is not met at the end of the session. That is the one. That is the thing I would like to experiment with. You know, the outcome and and how is whether it's accomplished. Yes, uh, a surprising uh, outcome that uh, maybe yeah, you didn't that you don't see. expect. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. whether it's useful in the long term, uh, deliverables, innovation, you know, time bound, inquisitiveness, mm -hmm. innovation, uniqueness, perfect analysis. Uh, return on investment, uniqueness. Okay, so. Uh, okay. So I think uh, we can, you know, we can probably yeah, wrap that up. But, but okay, continue. And continue to send, continue to send in your uh, comments while uh, Dr. Lisa Benson continues with the presentation. But go ahead, yeah. Yes, this is this is great. Some of the things that you mentioned, um, being original, innovative, sustainable, um, having objective outcomes and methods. Um, are are definitely um, things that you think about when you when you you know you you're brainstorming what you were interested in researching, but you've got to think about it in these more systematic ways, right? Um, and the and the observation that you 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 need to focus on whether it's applicable to practice or theory um, is definitely uh, these these are all paralleled with education research as well. So see, it's, it's, it's interesting, you actually know quite a bit about conducting education research. Much of what you know translates uh, from your own disciplines into education research. So um, let me advance my slides. There we go. Um, one thing I wanted to, to do to draw this parallel between what you understand about research and what we, the way we think about research in education is to look at some research principles that were established by the National Research Council here in the US. Um, there was a, a publication that came out in 2002 called Scientific Research in Education. And the National Research Council, the NRC, came up with six guiding principles, and we often refer to these as the NRC-6. Um, and the first principle is that uh, you need to pose questions that are significant and that can be investigated empirically. And those are really some of the things that you mentioned um, in, in your own definitions of uh, good research questions. Um, they need to be, the second principle is that um, the questions need to be or the research needs to link um, the the sorry <laughs> the research needs to be linked to relevant theory. So that would be education research theories, learning theory, education psychology, things like that. Um, using methods that permit direct empirical investigation of the question that you're asking. So again, some of the things that you mentioned is that like they, they need to be doable within constraints, things like that. Um, there need to be there needs to be reasoning, coherent, explicit chain of reasoning throughout the research. The research uh, kit should be uh, 
replicated and generalized across different studies and that that manifests itself in different ways depending on the methods that you're using but we can talk about that in um, a little a little while and then disclose the research to encourage professional scrutiny and critique that sort of goes back to the idea of replication too so these six principles um, often guide how we structure education research projects so one question I would ask you to think about is do our descriptions of good research questions need to be modified based on these guiding principles? Um, you could think about that for a moment, but honestly I would say probably not. I think many of your um, ideas about what makes a good research question um, also hold given these these principles as well. Many of these things you, you um, touched on in your own, your own um, definitions of research questions. So um, I'm going to keep these six principles in mind as we move forward um, talking about not only the research questions but what we what kinds of things we need to do to answer those questions. So um, getting started um, really what what it what should guide you as you're thinking about getting started in STEM education research is to think about some situation related to education that really fascinates you. Um, think about something that you're curious about, you're interested in it, you're passionate about it. The other thing to think about is the relevance to your own field and or global needs and challenges. And I often tell my, my graduate students this, think about what you are most passionate about and think about what the greatest need is in the world. And the intersection of those two things is where your research should be focused. So start to think about a question that you want to ask um, related to education. Write down the question that begins to form out of this curiosity interest and relevance. And you don't need to share it at this point, but I just want you to start to form a research question of your own. That's, a, that's an excellent uh, thing. Give them a, a couple of, a half a minute or so exactly. to reflect maybe. Yeah. Exactly. Like exactly. A simple and research question. I think I like the idea that passion and relevance. I think that's a fantastic combination. Yeah. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. So keep send, sending it by chat, by, by chat. You know, we, will, we will look at them later on. We won't look at them right away, but keep sending mm -hmm. this research question that you have in your mind. There's 72 of you. Uh, so keep sending them in you know, because uh, even if you don't get to it during the webinar, you know, this will be a good, you know, we, we have a record. You know, we are, the system will record all your comments and we will collect them at the after the webinar and send them uh, you know, to put them on a website or something and send them to uh, Dr. Lisa Benson as well so she gets some idea mm -hmm. what, what, uh, what the question, research questions were. And, and I think uh, from IUC side, I think we'd be curious to know what do you think are the good research questions that are going on in your mind so because we can structure our future programs uh, to cater to uh, to your thoughts and, and your needs. Okay, let's go on, uh, Elisa. Okay. So, um, yeah, again, as uh, Krishna said, please share those in the chat box. Um, and at some point, when you feel like you want to share them, not everybody does because um, so it, this is intensely personal, really, when you think about it. What is, what is something that really concerns you um, that's going on in your classroom or in your program? Often that's, people don't want to necessarily share that. But as you think about it in a systematic way, um, from a research standpoint, then it becomes easier to, to share in a, you know, sort of a, um, a more scientific way than, uh, than this, you know, this personal way. So, um, do share some of these research questions in the chat box and um, think about refining your question. And again, this may encourage you to share it. Refine your questions such that they are significant and can be investigated empirically. So that is where we're thinking about those NRC6 six, six principles. Can you Lisa, can I interrupt a minute here? Can you elaborate a little bit on that word empirically? Yeah, because uh, the language yes. sometimes in India might get lost, that word might get lost. Yes, yes, that's a really good point. Empirically investigated means you can gather evidence and you can show, you have uh, data to support um, the answer that you come up with to your question. So it's, um, 
you know, you could think about uh, questions that you could ask maybe that are not answerable. And honestly, I can't think of one right now at six o'clock in the morning, but um, you, you can imagine that there are questions that are sort of uh, rhetorical or questions that are just posed to make you think. Th those are not necessarily good research questions. If it's a good research question, you should be able to identify what types of evidence you would need to answer the question. Good, that's great. And that will be our next step, actually. Mm -hmm. So uh, do take a, take a minute just to, um, again, as you're writing down your research question um, that, that's forming out of your own passion and the relevance to your field, um, think about refining it such that it is significant and can be investigated. Um, and also think about, um, we know this from our own experience in research in STEM disciplines, a good research question isn't just a yes or no question, right? It's, it's something that needs to be investigated um, that's significant. If you have a yes or no question and you pose it um, through a big, you know, maybe you write a proposal around this question, if the answer is no, <laughs> you, you, you're kind of stuck. So <laughs> you want to ask a question that's more of a how or a why question, getting at some of those underlying reasons for things like student behavior or um, student performance. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So um, I would like to, I, I can't, I don't know, um, I can't quite see the chat window, but um, I would oh, yeah, like okay. to uh, focus would, on would one like example, it? yeah, one okay. example uh, research question maybe. Um, okay, I'll, I'll do that. I'll, I'll, I'll get you there, okay? Okay. Krishna, and you can choose this research question yourself out of the ones that you're seeing. I can, I can leave it up to you. Just, yeah, we sure. can pick one example research question, and then again, what I'm going to ask you to do is to think about this refining process. What okay, let's, evidence... Let's, let's take one question here. How to develop a mechanism to get feedback from industry, relevant experience in engineering education. That's one that's coming up. And let's say I'll just keep uh, skill assessment. In, uh, engineering. These are all very broad questions. Uh, passion, mm -hmm. uh, passion is motivating students by different means. Uh, yes, I guess they... Uh, how will entrepreneurial education system function? how to start research in your education, what research can be done. I think they haven't posed a research question yet. Okay, mm -hmm. here's one that, that makes that, that fits your, uh, how to implement problem-based learning in a, into a classroom activity in chemical engineering. Uh, then okay, we can focus on that. that because, yeah, focus on that, I think that'll be a good one, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so um, let's, I'll, I'll type this in my chat box. Um, how do how? we implement Problem-based learning. I'm just going to print, um, abbreviate sure. it as PBL um, yeah. in chemical engineering classrooms. Yeah. Correct. Absolutely. That That's correct? it. Yeah. Okay. So we can we can look at that as an example research question. It's a good. It's a how question, and we say how do we implement PBL? Um, you know, who who are we? We are probably faculty, right? Um, in chemical engineering classrooms. So you might want to refine that down a bit and say, um, focus on a specific level of class. You want to look at introductory classes um, to get your students engaged in problem solving and problem formation early on in their academic careers. Um, would you want to look at maybe capstone or senior level classes that help students pull together everything that they've learned and apply them to real world problems? So um, this is where you would need to refine your question a little bit. Okay. And if we have any ideas about that, please share them. Um, And if if uh, if we want to just move forward, I would say we can just pick one. Let's say um, we're going to implement PBL in, uh, say, sophomore level. Um, oops. Refine. Yeah, why don't, you, why don't you assume one of those? I'm, I'm okay. waiting to see if the same person is coming back. Okay, so refine the question by saying we're going to. Um, and I'm not sure if sophomore is a is a common term in Indian Yeah, that's um, a second year, just a second year. Second, second year, year. Yeah. yeah. Second yeah. year. 
he says, okay, let us come back. He says, let us think about the course at the earlier level, not at yes, the exam sir. caption. So you're mm -hmm. talking about second year. Yeah, that's what he Excellent. wants to Excellent. We're on the same yeah. page. Good, yeah. good. Okay, so uh, what evidence would we need to collect to answer this question? Um, and thinking about using methods that permit direct investigation, that's that empirical investigation again, and then providing co a coherent, explicit chain of reasoning. So this is where many uh, research questions either fall apart or they get really um, diffuse or they get you know less focused than they need to be. You know, you can imagine that there's a lot of resistance to problem-based learning, for example. Maybe faculty don't like implementing it. Maybe students don't like learning in that environment because it's hard work. <laughs> learning is hard work and problem-based learning is, is putting a lot of responsibility on the students to, to learn the material. Um, so there has to be some kind of chain of reasoning thinking through, okay, what are my goals for my students with problem-based learning? And how do I structure these these goals? Um, and how do I how do I assess some of those outcomes that I want those students to achieve? And making sure that problem-based learning is implemented in a, in an appropriate way. So that's one way of looking at it. Another way could be how do I get my faculty on board with problem-based learning? So that's really the when you look at that question, that how question. Um, and I've lost the question here, if I guess. And I'll, I'll put How, there it is. How do we implement um, PBL in chemical engineering classrooms? Maybe we need to think about how do we provide resources to faculty um, and reason through what do faculty need? What are they uh, most, what do they struggle with most when they're trying to implement problem-based learning? What are the outcomes that we want for our faculty? We can even think in terms of how are faculty rewarded for the efforts that they're putting in to create problem-based learning in their classroom. So that's what we're thinking about when we say a coherent, explicit chain of reasoning. Thinking through what is it that we're trying to ask and what are the different pieces of that puzzle that we that we need to put together. And then also thinking about being able to replicate and generalize this across studies. Do we want to look at all chemical engineering second year classes? Do we want to be able to generalize this across all engineering disciplines or STEM disciplines? Um, do we want to construct maybe um, case studies where we're looking at faculty you know, implement, who are implementing PBL in a way that we could give examples to other disciplines um, or other types of faculty members. So let's. Uh, I have a suggestion, Lisa. We can. Mm -hmm. This is such a broad. Uh, it's very it centralized across all disciplines. In fact, uh, yesterday we had a webinar by Rick Wes from WPI just on this topic. There may be some who might have uh, done that in a webinar also. Let us ask everyone who is in this audience today uh, to assume that this is the research. Some of you will respond and will have that as a, as a passion and maybe give some ideas as to what evidence you need to collect to answer this research question. Uh, fine, go ahead, uh, Lisa. Okay. Come up with, yeah. So, yeah, and uh, Krishna, if you have, uh, if people are sharing their ideas in the chat yeah. box, uh, just, yeah. just let me know. Sure. Um, yeah. But again, thinking about this, um, refining the not only the question, but the, sort of an iterative process, right? When you start thinking about evidence, that's when you're going to start narrowing down. Do I look at this from a faculty perspective? Do I look at this from a student perspective? Or one, even... One, one, one comment says interview the participants to collect the data. Another one says internal and external evaluation. And so yeah, they're, they're coming in some of those responses. Go ahead. Yeah, they're not, nothing, nothing more as yet. They're thinking. <laughs> Okay, and so uh, my comment would be, if we interview participants, would that be both faculty and students? Yeah, 
Okay, then uh, they, then Santil Kumar says, well, how, what is the process of classroom planning by the faculty? What mm -hmm. kind of uh, mm -hmm. planning would you do in uh, terms of activities in, the, in each classroom? Another one says, what, how would you get uh, industry involved in assessing whether this has the process has worked, uh, the project-based learning? This is uh, great. So keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. Yeah, keep coming, this is coming. great. I love the idea of getting industry input. So when you say, how do we implement problem-based learning, we could focus on the problems. Like what problems do we have students work on? And maybe pulling our industry um, members that are going to be hiring our graduates to uh, get their input on those problems. And look at grades as expected by stakeholder and uh, uh, evaluation method. Now, how, do, how would you modify your evaluation method? How would you evaluate oh, uh, such, a, such, such a course and, 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 and get, give grades? Uh, then uh, maybe a project-based learning could involve reverse engineering of some uh, product. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, then uh, people keep coming back to the industry needs, I guess, identify problems faced by industry, convert them into case studies. Uh, how to collect yeah. problems that are relevant to industry. Yeah, so asking the research question you know, in, the, in that direction and trying to collect that kind of evidence. That's a great, um, you know, there are a couple of really great ideas in there, but this idea of uh, grades and student performance assessment uh, and modifying how you're assessing their performance based on problem-based learning is a great point because um, that's part of the how do you implement PBL, right? If you are changing what you're asking students to do because you want them to achieve different outcomes than they are achieving in, say, a lecture-based class, then really you need to change your assessments. Um, if you're asking them to develop uh, more sort of uh, metacognitive skills, thinking about their thinking or planning, or maybe you're asking them to work more on uh, problem definition, something that we really don't ask our students to do very much, but maybe with problem-based learning they're getting better at scoping out a problem and defining a problem, then you would need to assess that. You would need to maybe put some questions on um, tests or give them some type of project that has a rubric that assesses how well they're able to define problems. So those are great examples of the type of evidence you would need to collect to say, yes, they're not only learning the content, but they're learning problem solving as well through PBL. Okay, they've slowed down a little bit, so go ahead. Okay, this is this is great. Um, so that it, this again, this audience is super. You just set this this next slide up beautifully. <laughs> so uh -huh. um, the variables that could be investigated with a question, for example, of how do you implement PBL. Um, can be looked at from different perspectives. So if you're looking at it from a student perspective, you might look at different student demographics or maybe even their academic background. Where did they come from? What kind of training did they get in high school or pre-college? You know, pre um, or you might look at demographics, male and female, or different regions of the country that they're from. And then some of the dependent variables would be, if you're looking at it from a student perspective, a dependent variable would be achievement or performance, just like we just mentioned. Um, you could look straight up at grades, or you can look at things like achievement on a certain project at the end of the semester. Or you could even look at achievement in follow-on classes. You could do a more long-term study where you're looking at how those students who are in that PBL class achieve and, and perform in classes in their junior and senior years. So there are many different ways of um, looking at um, variables that can be investigated. If you're looking at it from the teacher or faculty perspective, in, in terms of how to implement PBL, you might look at those the, the level of expertise of that faculty member both in their own content area, but also in terms of education, like pedagogy, how to teach, what kind of experience do they have, or kind of, what kind of training do they get um, in PBL. And then um, a dependent variable would be changes in attitudes, maybe not towards students, this is, this is really geared towards another type of question, but changes in attitudes towards teaching PBL. You, know, they, you might poll them at the beginning of the semester, and all of them are 
deathly afraid of what is going to happen in their classroom and then maybe by the end of the semester they've they've you know through different um, maybe faculty development resources that you've put in place or different partnerships with industry or um, different structures that you've put in place in the classroom maybe they've changed their attitude about PBL and be, and you know they're more at peace with it so this, then, this, this point yeah. uh, is an interesting point that, that you're raising is about uh, attitudes of faculty, which means that uh, if, if, for example, this was a question posed by a faculty member in a, in, in, a, in a department, maybe they can make it a departmental project and, 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 and involve all the faculty in, in terms of doing this research. It can be a research project not just for one individual faculty member, but for a group of faculty members who want to improve the teaching and learning process in the department. What do you think? Oh, that is a, that is such a good point, Krishna. And I, I don't want to get off topic here. I could talk about this all day long <laughs> because okay. it is so hard to do this as um, a, I would call it a lone wolf model. It was so hard to do it alone because, first of all, you don't have a community of practice. You don't have a, a you know, sort of that critical mass, if you think about that in engineering terms, um, a, a critical mass, the energy that comes from talking to other people about, okay, I tried this out today. It didn't work. How do you think I could change this up? Or I have this idea for my next class. What do you think? So there are things like that that are so important to being able to um, build your, your faculty expertise. But the other reason is, from our student perspective, if our students only see this in one class, in your class, for example, you introduce this thing called problem-based learning and you have these students do all these crazy activities that are so different from sitting and taking notes, they look at you like you're a, an alien from outer space. You're doing something really strange with them and they think, okay, I just need to get through this semester and you know, doing the crazy stuff that Dr. Vedula wants me to do and then I'm going to move on and go back to my normal way of thinking, which is I just need to take notes and spit back whatever people are telling me. So it's really hard to get a, a, a effect out of this approach if, if students only see it in an isolated case. Mm -hmm. So it's such a good point um, that this, if you, if you want to say, looking at that question, how do you implement PBL in chemi chemi chem chemical engineering? I would say first talk to all of your colleagues and get as many of them on board with doing it and, and do it together. Um, yep. Okay. That's a great idea. Um, and then another way of looking at variables that can be investigated is through the context. The, the actual context of, oh, in this case, it's chemical engineering. So how difficult is the content that they're trying to learn? So maybe you pick one of the second, second year courses that are particularly difficult for students. Um, and I don't know chemical engineering well enough, but I know there's things like unit operations that I hear students complaining about that maybe that's a junior level class but um, or things like thermodynamics or um, uh, I classes that were challenging for me <laughs> that was, that was <laughs> one of them um, so picking a you know what level of difficulty of the of the content and then talking about an outcome such as classroom climate um, that would be um, how much interaction do your students have with each other? Um, how positive or uh, what, what are their attitudes towards the content that you're trying to teach? Um, and in that case, maybe you want to do a comparative study with a, a classroom that's using PBL and a classroom that's more traditionally taught. Um, what are student attitudes towards their um, their confidence in being able to do problems that are using this, these uh, the concepts that you're trying to teach. So that would be again focusing on that context or the content and not so much on the students themselves or the faculty members. And I'm going to I'm going to stop. I'm going to um, I'm going to go through another a few more slides about ways that we can investigate things in education research, and then I'll stop and ask a couple of sure. questions. Okay. Um, so another way to think about 
conducting education research um, and is how you design the study. So one way to do it would be a cross-sectional design. So that would be um, you would collect data and do the investigation at the same time across many participants at different levels. So maybe like I uh, the, the previous example would be looking at students in a PBL class and a non-PBL class. Um, this would allow for um, more correlational or comparative um, outcomes than rather than causal like for example you wouldn't be able to necessarily point to PBL directly as the causal as the reason behind certain outcomes but you would be able to compare things between PBL and non PBL um, there are many opportunities for confounding variables when you're doing a cross-sectional study for example if you have students in a PBL class and a non PBL class they'll never be equal on in terms of their background in terms of their attitudes in terms of their abilities you know the students are as varied as the you know as as the rainbow they're they're all different kinds of students there are also all different kinds of faculty you'll never be able to get the same exact type of faculty member with the same background and attitudes and um, content expertise so there's a lot that's of a good, confounding that goes that's a good on point. that's a very good point Lisa I think and again that's what research is all about trying to you know wade through all these complexities and I think the I think the concept of maybe comparing a class where a faculty member uses PBL in a reasonably effective manner another one that does not use PBL and and, and, and I think that kind of approach might be worth the, a department to take you know to, to, to kind of you know work on the departmental project right, right. Right, and it takes a lot of data and a lot of really uh, um, in-depth digging to yeah. avoid things like confounding uh, variables. <laughs> Another approach would be a longitudinal approach, and this is one that I mentioned where maybe you want to look at participants across time. For example, you introduce PBL in their second year, and then you look at how they perform on their um, senior projects or capstone design projects or some other kind of project that they have in their senior year um, and that would be especially appropriate if they see PBL more than one time you know if they see it just in one second year class and they never see it again it would be hard to hard to um, make claims about causality but if you have maybe a sustained effort throughout the department you may be able to interview students and ask them how did PBL contribute to your ideas about problem solving then you can maybe um, get to some of the underlying causal you know the, the causality between implementing PBL and and the desired outcomes so um, there are um, many opportunities for <laughs> for problems collecting data I didn't word that very well what I meant was that there can be a longitudinal data you can imagine that you have some students in a second year class they transfer they take different classes than what you intended for them to take they um, drop out of school they um, don't answer your surveys <laughs> there's lots of reasons why you lose participants across a longitudinal study so that you have to be aware of that from the beginning and gather up as much information as you possibly can from that initial cohort that initial group of students so that with attrition over the years you know maybe even if you only get 20 percent of them responding by their senior year you still have enough data to work with for a longitudinal can, study can I interrupt here just a minute yes. to give a little oh, uh, uh, high-level uh, thinking um, the uh, problem that we face here as well in the United States is um, do those who do research in a domain area like nanotechnology or biotechnology they are used to the research process now those who are thinking of research in education teaching they tend to think that okay I'm going to get into a classroom and try out some of these ideas uh, and, 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 and and then they don't follow up in terms of assessment and, and mm -hmm. thoughtful reflection. So that is like if you're doing research in nanotechnology or biotechnology and all that you do is keep continuously doing experiments and, 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 and not collect data uh, and not related to theory and not related to the, what's going on in the world, then that's, that's a whole bunch of experiments you're doing but of no use to anybody. So what do you think of that? Uh, you know, oh, that's a, yeah, that's another really good point and it's a, a uh, real uh, it's a pet peeve of mine <laughs> that many people think that um, if they are showing uh, 
you know, demonstrating that their students are happy. You know, they, they have pictures of happy students in their classroom. <laughs> then they say, ah, oh, my, my approach was successful. Um, but that you would no sooner do that in research than you would, um, you know, in, in, in engineering or science than you would in education. You know, you wouldn't show a picture of a bridge that's standing and say, I've successfully built a, you know, a, a sustainable structure um, without ever testing it, without ever using, um, you know, mechanics of materials concepts to, to demonstrate that your bridge is strong. Um, so you would you would no more want to do that in education research than you would in engineering research. Um, so definitely uh, the idea that you need to have a, this systematic approach, this scientific approach to education research is really important. And it's, it's particularly a problem with education research and higher education, I think, because all of us who are here Everyone in this webinar and everyone who, who is in higher education has been in the education system our whole lives. We were either students or we were teachers for the majority of our lives. And we feel like we know this field really well. <laughs> we've, been, we've been on both sides of the, of the desk. We've been in classrooms most of our lives. We know it really well. So we feel, uh, people feel empowered to do education research even if they don't have the training or this sort of scientific approach to it. So that I think is why there's this uh, proliferation of um, people doing kind of one-off things or just taking a, a very um, informal approach to um, trying things out in their classroom without really examining what evidence there is that it may be successful or what evidence there is that it's a good idea. Um, so yeah, that again, I could talk for hours on that one. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So um, one final thing I want to talk about. Well, actually, no. I, um, it's not final. <laughs> There's <laughs> one of many things that I want to talk about. Um, another way to characterize education research is the methods that you use, and this is just not even scratching the surface. This is um, we could have courses in each one of these uh, methods that are, you know, semester-long courses, <laughs> but just to get you used to what the terminology is. Um, there are quantitative methods that are used in education research. Um, these result in numerical data. They use statistical methods. Um, usually um, it includes a large number of participants, maybe across multiple institutions or even multiple countries, um, and it's something we call quasi-experimental. We're used to in engineering and science being able to control all the variables that we want to control and vary only the ones that we want to vary. Um, that's very difficult, as I mentioned, in education research because we can't control who sits in our classrooms. We can't control the, the background of our faculty. Uh, there are many institutional variables that we can't control. So we call it quasi-experimental rather than experimental. Another approach to education research is qualitative, and this, I can tell you from experience, is very hard to get our heads around. As an, as an engineer and a scientist, this sounds like storytelling when you first start talking about it, but um, believe me, it is a very powerful research method. What you're doing with qualitative research is you're creating descriptive data often in textual format, but it can be in video format or even um, the other types of artifacts like student um, student work, you know, written work, um, handwritten work, that kind of thing, um, or design, that kind of thing. But it's descriptive and it's analyzed using text analysis methods or video analysis methods. Um, and usually there's a much smaller number of key participants so um, often, again, engineers and scientists have a hard time getting their heads around why you would even use this if there's only one or two or a dozen participants. Um, people often ask, well, what can you, what kind of generalizations can you make about what you're finding if you only have one participant or two participants? And um, the answer is it is not as generalizable 
as quantitative. In fact, it's often not generalizable at all, but it is transferable. It is something that you can learn from. Um, so if you're learning from the from an in-depth case study of maybe one participant that's going through an experience, um, maybe you interview a student or a faculty member in your PBL class that was really resistant to the idea at the beginning, you ask lots of questions about why are you why are you hesitating um, participating? What is stopping you? Where are the challenges? Um, what is helping you? What kind of resources are you finding? Things like that. You can learn from that one student's experience or that one faculty member's experience much more than you can from a quantitative survey even. So that's the, that's the value in qualitative research. And then the other way of thinking about education research methods is mixed methods. And this is some con combination of quantitative and qualitative. Um, and they can be done in order. Maybe you collect, a, a, you, you, uh, collect survey data, quantitative data, and then you follow up by interviewing people who have answered your survey um, with a qualitative study. So it can be done in order. Or it can be done concurrently, where you imp you're collecting both quantitative and qualitative data, maybe on, for example, student performance. Maybe you're you're looking at course grades, and you're looking at maybe their responses to some kind of uh, reflection question. There can be an emphasis on one of them. Maybe you're focusing mostly on your developing a survey, for example, and then following it up with a qualitative study, or you can have them equally weighted. So the mixing of mixed methods occurs at any point. It can occur during the data collection. You can mix the analysis, or you can mix during the interpretation phase. Great. Uh, you, you have another slide, or this is it? Okay, yeah, I have one more way to characterize okay. education yeah, research. Sure. Then I promise I'm going to stop and ask for questions. Sure. Sure. One more way to think about this, and I know I'm throwing a lot of information out there, um, but I do want to get, again, this terminology under your belts. Um, you can think about descriptive questions. So um, in terms of your PBL question, describe what is occurring. Um, so rather than maybe asking how to implement um, PBL in chemical engineering classrooms, a descriptive question would be, in what ways do students um, interact with problems? in a PBL classroom, or in what ways do faculty gain um, expertise or confidence in um, teaching in a PBL format. So that would be a descriptive. A relationship question would be looking at relationships between two or more variables or factors. So that would be more of a how question, for example, how does um, faculty content expertise relate to their ability to implement PBL? Or how does um, an industry partnership affect the success of students in a PBL classroom? So that would be a relationship question. And then causality questions um, often involve some type of controlled intervention. That's sort of that quasi-experiment that I mentioned to establish a causal relationship between two or more variables. And again, that may be done with a large quantitative study looking at um, maybe the causality between two different factors that you're like incoming student GPA or something like that or um, some other factor that you would want to look at. And then another way to th uh, think about um, education research questions or in terms of design. You might want to do research based on designing an intervention such as PBL and intertwine that with development of a learning theory. So you may want to partner with a learning science faculty member um, or a psychology faculty member and develop some kind of theory about how Stu engineering students interact or develop problem-solving expertise through um, an intervention like PBL. So that would be d a design of um, both the intervention and the theory. So um, that was, let me just... Um, fantastic. That's fantastic, Lisa. We have okay. a few minutes left, and uh, yeah. I encourage the uh, participant to send in a few critical questions they want to send in. But uh, while they're doing that, let me uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, let me put myself in the in the uh, position of uh, these 70 or so faculty who have been here. Uh, so they have you have exposed them very 
nicely to what is engineering education research. And I think uh, since most of them, as you've seen, are novices, they're saying, "Wow, this is exciting! Uh, you know, I can, I can, I can be passionate and and come up with this, uh, with some of these questions." But but it's so difficult. It's going to be so difficult for me to get to that point. <laughs> it's, uh, it sounds yes. like a lot of hard, lot, lot of hard work. Uh, how how would you reassure uh, these faculty who are right now? In the very early stages, that uh, this is something that they it will take time and and over the years, so they will build a career and become mm -hmm. in 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 doing this because this is what I think a large number of faculty in India need to follow this kind of a path. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I would I would make a couple of suggestions. One is um, I would form a faculty um, a reading group or a book. Club. Club or, or something, some kind of uh, a group of people who are interested in, for example, if in implementing problem-based learning, I would I would gather faculty um, as often as you want to meet, uh, you know, once a week, once a month, something like that, and have specific targeted readings on because there's a lot of research out there about problem-based learning. Um, and maybe have a, a group leader that rotates each month. Maybe um, each of you poses, a, a, you know, suggests a reading, and then leads the discussion on that reading. And then you have a discussion around your specific goals. Um, if you want to, for example, implement problem-based learning in your second-year chemi courses, get your chemi faculty as well as other faculty who are interested in PBL and maybe even if you have a school of education someone in the school of education that's uh, that has expertise in whatever um, type of questions you want to ask if you need someone who's an expert on student self-efficacy their their confidence in being able to do something maybe you want um, an expert in um, some type of learning theory about like uh, complexity. There's there's a lot of research out there about complexity, um, things like that. So I would gather people, do directed readings and reflections, and then come up with some kind of action plan for you know the sequential meetings. That okay, we read about PBL in classes. Now we need to know more about how to measure specific outcomes. And you do another reading on um, measuring. Uh, problem-solving skills and then maybe you do you know the, so you continue on and you build your expertise together um, that would be one suggestion another would be to um, continue to offer these workshops to build your the expertise of the faculty who want to do these studies or implement these these different approaches in the classroom um, and then you know do one specifically I think you had one recently on PBL so the next one would be doing some uh, a workshop maybe on assessing outcomes um, mm -hmm. and uh, be specific in terms of what outcomes you want to achieve so um, being intentional about what you want to do um, and you can't do it all <laughs> but you could you can you know take some first steps right uh, so those would be two suggestions Fantastic. I, I think we've uh, run over our time, and I usually don't try to you know, let this run over time. So uh, there are a few questions, but I, you know, I think uh, we don't need to, at this point, you know, they're important, but I think we don't have time to do that. So I'll just uh, you know, collect them together, and maybe we can interact with them later on. Uh, so any closing remarks from you? Um, well, here I have my last slide. Um, I would like to say thank you to everyone who's attending uh, for your input. This was great. You, you really um, helped pull us all together. Um, I think uh, I'd be happy to field any questions that you have, and my email address is there. Um, I would encourage you to go to education uh, conferences. Like um, we have. Um, the American Society for Engineering Education has partner institutions in um, Southeast Asia and Asia. There's an Australasian version of uh, education, engineering education um, conferences. Um, so I'd encourage you to attend those or at least read some of the, the conference papers. But um, it's been a, a pleasure to, to do this introduction and I, I hope to uh, do do more of this and see more of you in the future. 
Thank you. Th thank you so much, Lisa. Just just to mention, we started a very very baby version of such a conference in India for the last couple of years. Uh, mm -hmm. We're still. You know, it's called the International Conference on Transformations in Engineering Education. So I'll send you some information on that. Maybe in one of the future conferences, we can have you come over and uh, address these people in person. Okay. Thank you very much, Lisa. Appreciate it. That'll be very exciting. Uh, thank you. And thank and you have all. A good evening. Yeah. Have a great. Day. Great week. Bye.